And that relates to, are we going to see a college football season or a college season? Well, not this one, but the one after that might have a very different set of rules to be played around. I don't mean on the field either. I want to bring in my friend Pete Thamel from Yahoo Sports. Pete is one of the best voices in college sports, and he has a great perspective on all of these things. Pete, I want to share with everyone what the NCAA Board of Governors announced today and then get your immediate reaction to it. So let's give you the key points of what the NCAA Board of Governors approved from a working group that was meeting on these things. Essentially, it's the name, image, and likeness part. Supporting the rule change to allow third-party endorsements so essentially the players can get paid for doing stuff outside of playing their sports. I think as you go down, you start to see where the guide rails are being set. Supporting of compensation for social media, business, and personal appearances. So if you go to a local car dealer, you can get paid for that, essentially, or social media, big followings. Student athletes can identify themselves by sport and school. I'm Tua Tonga Vailoa from Alabama, but you can't use the SEC or the Big A script logo when doing that, if Tua was still in school, of course. And then the last point, and perhaps one that'll be different in conversation, at no point should a university or college pay a student athlete for name, image, and likeness. So it's not you to the recruit and say, hey, I guarantee a 10 grand family when you come to uh, state U, but... You can go earn that on your own. Of all these guidelines, Pete, which one sticks out the boldest in your mind? I need more than ten grand, Mike. You know that. Um, you know, I think uh, I think that <laughs> exactly. the, the the biggest my biggest takeaway from today is a this is a significant day. It's long overdue, and the the NCAA you know amateurism models and other sports w went through I, I believe more than twenty years ago. So. This has been long inertia. Mm -hmm. It's going to modernize college sports. It's great for college athletics. So I think that's the that's the, that's the number one fundamental takeaway. And then just as the NCAA makes this announcement today, and my phone starts to ring, and I and I dial in, it's like a lot of NCA things that we come across. Mike, we we can only really answer the questions with the questions, right? Like, so if uh, right. you know athletic directors have really not wanted this financial model into the recruiting process. But my question is, how do you avoid it being in the recruiting process? If you're the University of Washington mm -hmm. and the CEO of Amazon wants to help the Washington basketball program, um, it's not, a, it's, you know, so you can give them a million dollars or you could say, I'll put you on an Amazon billboard, um, Jaden McDaniels or Isaiah Stewart, and we'll give you a million dollars that way. Like that, it's going to be impossible for this to not leak into the recruiting uh, environment, even though that that's sort of one of the stated things. So this is going to be messy, Mike. There, there's no other way to say it. And there's good intention here, but the the in terms of like then say wanting to keep this as clean as possible, but it it is going to become. I mean, what college athletics already is, right? I mean, it's going to become the rich getting a lot richer, and it's going to force programs, universities to be creative, in in order to help lure student athletes. You can tell why I wanted to have Pete on, because he was educated at a very smart university for communication students. I won't tell you which one. But Pete, you just hit the two questions that I had for you. The rich getting richer part of it. Uh, if you're Texas and you've got a big oil guy, forget the oil prices for the moment. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you not say, hey, if, if you come and we're at our car dealership and we give you uh, $10,000, uh, we'll do that for the next four years. How do you not say that as part of the conversation with a recruit? And then, Pete, the second part of this, which I, I want to drill down on a little bit. In this, the NCA essentially said, we want the federal government's help. We don't yeah. want each state to continue on the paths where Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, started. We want the federal government to come in and be the overarching group to help us out. And in addition to that, we want a little protection for ourselves along the way. To me, that's going to be a problem that's going to be a little sticky in dealing with the congressmen and women around the country as well. Well, yes. And, and, you know, there was a good story in Sports Illustrated earlier this week that really got the views of a, a lot of people from Congress on this. And Congress is united, basically saying the student athletes should have been for a long time gotten what their fair market value is. And this is certainly going to help them uh, help them get to that. But look, Mike, I mean, the only two organizations that work slower and are messier are the NCAA and Congress. And now they have to unite. <laughs> so I really think like saying this is right. going to be some type of like clean ending to this is 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 a little bit uh is, is a little bit naive there's still there's about 16 months until this is enacted for the uh kids who hit campus in the fall of 2021 and there are still giant questions including like an ask to congress that's a big deal especially right now during a pandemic 
Exactly. Let's get to the specifics of if there's going to be a football season in the fall of 2020, because as you said, this legislation wouldn't kick in until that following fall of 2021, that academic year. Pete, you talked to a lot of folks in intercollegiate athletics on the record and off. What kind of sense are you getting trending toward a potential delay or big pushback in the start of the college football season? Well, three thoughts on this, Mike. My first one is, and I've said this for about a month, if you think all 130 FBS institutions will be back with students on campus and be in good enough shape to have fans in the stands for September 5th, you're crazy. There's a zero chance that that's going to happen at all 130 FBS schools. So in my mind, it's the second point is there's some type of delay and how you handle that is going to be really interesting. There's going to be either a fractured model, which is say universities in the South where the governors seem to be a little bit more liberal about wanting people to go back to, to normal lives and get the economy going. Do you have more regionalized schedules and you know blow up your traditional alliances and schedules in order to force a season because that's what people wanna have? Or do you have a model mm -hmm. where you wait until you know, my joke when people ask me when the season is going to start is my over-under is January 21st for college football. Do you have the model where you wait till the spring, play in the spring, push everything back, push the NFL draft back, play in Wisconsin in February, which couldn't be fun for anybody involved. But do you do that in order to, you know, in, in order to kind of have all of college football have an entire season and have a playoff and fulfill all the, you know, fulfill all the TV windows just in different times. So I, I don't think it's a question of if it's delayed. I think it's what type of delay and what that looks like. The best chance to have a college and football why that season. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Do you finish your thought there? So the, the best chance to have a college football season, in my opinion, from talking to all the people I've talked to, mm -hmm. is to delay it to January. By then, you have a better chance of having a lot of students on campus. You have a better chance of playing with fans. Places like Ohio State and Florida make over $50 million in ticket revenue. And you have a better chance to not have a second wave and have the season start and then stop, et cetera. So that's I, I think the cleanest answer here is to give the American machinery time for testing, tracing, hopefully a vaccine and push it all back to January to start then, because the quarantine model doesn't seem like it would work in college athletics. And we are talking about this name, image and likeness and this separate issue of the season happening. They do tie in one place usually where you trace everything back to, and that's money, because the money from football drives all of these athletic departments. It drives all of these Olympic sports as well. So that's why there is going to be everything done possible, even if you have to push back three months to have a football season. One last point in a minute left here, Pete, and we can do this for, for an hour. Then there's college basketball. Uh, separate from name, image, and likeness is the G League taking some of these big high school recruits and saying, don't worry about the one year of college. Don't go to Australia or somewhere in Asia to play basketball. Come to the G League directly. We'll set up some traveling all-star prep team, if you will, uh, for that time before you're ready for the NBA draft. How much of an impact do you think this will have on the quality of college basketball across the top of the uh, spectrum? My take on this, Mike, is it, it, it's not going to doom college basketball, but it's just another reason to not watch college basketball. And college basketball has given us a lot of reasons to not watch it. The quality of play this last year, quite frankly, just wasn't mm -hmm. very good. There's no stars. Uh, I when agree. I was just looking at a list of top returners, and James Boatnight from UConn is going to be you know, one of the best players in college basketball. He's a fine player, but he's not drawing in the common fan the way, you know, some of these kids who are going to the G League may have the, you know, just the, the way some of the kids who went to Australia last year, Hampton and Ball would have. So between the 80 kids a year who are leaving the sport, who would be your second, third year stars, the transferring, which makes rosters unrecognizable in a constant state of flux and the lack of high end stars, I really feel like the sport is amid an identity crisis. College sports, the big ones, football and basketball, have major issues. There's no individual to run each one. The NCAA is the collection of the institutions. Each one points back to the other, and it's a bit messy right now. And this is really going to take a while to try to unpack, along with everything that's on top of the shelf, and that's the pandemic. Pete, thanks for a few minutes. I'm going to get you back here at some point. We'll talk more about the issues facing college athletics with a little more detail. But thanks for jumping in on the big news of the morning. Mike, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.